not interested in playing politics with the border or immigration. I'm interested in fixing it. Once again, President Biden has rolled out the red carpet for illegal migrants. Prior military, I identify with him. I understand the struggles he went through and what he represents. Hello, I'm Nancy Cordes in Washington, and welcome to America Decides. President Biden has unveiled sweeping new action to offer legal protections to roughly 500,000 undocumented migrants nationwide. The steps I'm taking today are overwhelmingly supported by the American people, no matter what the other team says. In fact, polls show over 70 percent of Americans support this effort to keep families together. The new plan is the largest expansion of immigration policy since DACA, also known as Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, during the Obama years. It's going to prevent some undocumented spouses of U.S. citizens, along with their children, from facing deportation. And it makes it easier for them to apply for work visas and lawful permanent residency. Camilo Montoya Galvez and Ouija Jang join us now to discuss it. Camilo is a CBS News immigration and politics reporter. Ouija is CBS News senior White House correspondent. Welcome to you both. Camilo, you are the expert. So explain to us when this program goes into effect and how it's going to work. Hi, Nancy. As you underscored, this will be the biggest immigration program for undocumented immigrants in the U.S. since the DACA policy for DREAMers that just turned 12 years old this past weekend. Now, undocumented spouses of American citizens will be able to apply for work permits and deportation protections if they have lived here in the U.S. for at least 10 years. But perhaps more importantly, Nancy, these eligible immigrants will also get a more streamlined path and process for seeking U.S. citizenship and also permanent residency. An immigrant right now, Nancy, is eligible for a green card if he or she marries a U.S. citizen. But many of these immigrants who have been here illegally in the country have to first go back to their home country and re-enter the U.S. legally to get that green card. But that process can actually trigger a 10-year ban from the U.S. This new policy will prevent that from happening by allowing these immigrants to adjust their status here in the U.S. to green card status and after five years, U.S. citizenship. So it is a massive policy change by the Biden administration. And officials tell us that it is expected to open up to new applications by the end of the summer. Yeah, a lot of these um, undocumented immigrants are dreamers. Uh, they came to this country as children and don't even uh, really have any memories of their home country. We ju the president himself acknowledged today, though, that some progressives were angry about the asylum crackdown that he announced a couple weeks ago. So is that why he followed it up so quickly with this plan that they're going to like a lot more? Well, the White House says, Nancy, that no, that is not the reason, that this is not meant to offset that other policy, as you mentioned, which really restricts uh, the way that people can request asylum at ports of entry. But to your point, the president himself said that both things can be true. We can support, cure the border while also being American. And that is exactly what his message focused on today, that, you know, he felt his hands were tied and he blamed Congress, especially Senate Republicans, for not moving forward on a way to control the flow of migrants at the border. At the same time, he said he wanted to find a way to keep families together. And that is why he rolled out today's policy. But uh, there were progressives here, lawmakers, there were immigration advocates, who were really praising the president's decision today. And, of course, they were the exact same people who were uh, criticizing him just two weeks ago for that other action. So even though the White House says that this was not in direct response to that, uh, certainly you can draw that line, especially right. since the president himself did. No question. Camillo, you know, generally when an administration tries to establish a sweeping new immigration plan without Congress, uh, it eventually gets struck down by the courts. And I'm talking about Democratic presidencies, Republican presidencies. Is that a likelihood in this case? Very much so, Nancy. Republican left states are almost certainly going to challenge this executive action by President Biden in the federal court system. We know that Virtually every major immigration action by the president over the past three years has been challenged by Republican left states, including his more generous immigration policies. 
and we should expect another lawsuit from Texas and other Republican-led states who, by the way, back during the Obama administration, were able to strike down a policy that would have given work permits to the undocumented parents of U.S. citizens and green card holders. So this policy is likely to face legal challenges. The Biden administration is preparing for those challenges, but it will argue that it has the legal authority to do this and that the president has taken action, Nancy, because Congress, as you know, has not passed a major significant update to the immigration system, rather, since the 1990s. Yes, every effort has uh, failed spectacularly in Congress. Uh, we do the Trump campaign put out a statement, pretty blistering. They said, quote, Biden has created another invitation for illegal immigration through his mass amnesty order. What do polls tell us about what voters actually want to see? Do they support making it easier for undocumented immigrants to gain citizenship? So when you take a step back and look more broadly, Nancy, for that group of voters that considers immigration to be a major uh, factor in their vote. A recent CBS News poll shows that Trump is actually beating Biden there. 75% uh, of those people, compared to 23%, say that they would support Trump. But then, when you look at a recent uh, uh, poll by the Pew Research Center that just came out in April that specifically addressed uh, the president's actions today about whether undocumented immigrants currently living in the U.S. should be able to stay legally, 59 percent of voters say yes. So it seems hmm. that they are in favor of what the president uh, announced today. That is really interesting. Uh, Camillo, the asylum program was announced by the president a couple of weeks ago, turning asylum seekers back anytime migrant encounters reach a certain threshold at the southern border. What's the status of that program? Has this had any effect on the flow of migrants across the border, or is it just too soon to say? Nancy, there has been a dramatic drop in illegal crossings along the U.S.-Mexico border since President Biden enacted this crackdown on asylum there. A U.S. official tells CBS News that just on Monday yesterday, Border Patrol this apprehended okay. roughly 2,000 migrants. That is the lowest level of illegal crossings since 2020, when the COVID-19 wow. pandemic severely depressed migration to the U.S. So officials would point to that as evidence that it is having an impact in deterring some people from crossing into the U.S. illegally. It is still, I think, Nancy, too early to make any definitive conclusions. But again, the administration would say that it is having an impact and that time Time will tell whether or not eventually this will re lead to a permanent drop in illegal migration. And of course, progressives complain that uh, this is a major rollback of asylum protections that have been in place for decades. That's right. We do, I want to switch gears and ask you about something uh, that just happened this afternoon. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released a statement accusing the U.S. of continuing to withhold weapons from Israel. This was news to most. How is the White House responding? It was news to the White House, apparently, Nancy, because <laughs> Karine Jean-Pierre said, quote, we genuinely do not know what he's talking about. We just don't. She went on to say that there was one shipment of high payload munitions that was on pause in early May and that the U.S. continues to have conversations with Israel about that particular shipment. And it was paused out of concern for the Israeli offensive into Rafah and uh, a lot of unknowns about how they would carry out their military operation there. But uh, Jean-Pierre says that that was the only and is the only shipment in question and that there have not been any others. And so she's saying that she doesn't know what Netanyahu was talking about. But Nancy, it's interesting that he not only issued a statement, he did so uh, in a video. So he was speaking English. This was clearly for a Western audience, and it comes uh, just days after he disbanded his war cabinet. Um, right. And so there are many questions about how that could impact his decision-making, his statements, and strategy moving forward. Yeah, there's been so much tumult in his cabinet. It makes you wonder if he's looking to put up a straw man somewhere else to distract uh, some domestic attention. Uh, Camilo Montoya Galvez and Weijia Jiang, thank you both so much for your insights. Russian President Vladimir Putin has vowed to deepen ties with North Korea and support it against 
the United States. This message of unity comes as the Russian leader visits North Korea for the first time in 24 years. It's unclear exactly how far Putin is going to go to support Kim Jong-un. Prior to his arrival, he also thanked North Korea for supporting his actions in Ukraine. They've been providing a lot of ammunition. The streets of North Korea's capital city, Pyongyang, have been decorated with Russian flags and portraits of President Putin. Senate Republicans block a measure to ban bump stocks on guns after the Supreme Court strikes down a Trump-era ban on the devices. Our Scott McFarlane is on Capitol Hill with more on why the measure failed to move forward. There he is. Your Streaming America Decides. We'll be right back. And we have to have action. We don't have any action. By the way, bump stocks, we're writing that out. I'm writing that out myself. I don't care if Congress does it or not. I'm writing it out myself. That was then-President Donald Trump back in 2018. But more than six years later, Senate Republicans have killed a measure to ban bump stocks. Those are those tools that enable semi-automatic weapons to shoot at a very rapid pace, more like a machine gun. The vote followed last week's decision from the Supreme Court that threw out the Trump administration ban. Our Scott McFarland joins us now from Capitol Hill. Scott, you are watching all of this unfold. So walk us through what went down that ended with this measure being killed. Did it get any Republican support? There were really no expectations of Republican support, so no surprise when a Republican stopped what they call that unanimous consent vote, trying to expedite and fast track this into law. It was Nebraska, Republican Pete Ricketts, who blocked this proposal from New Mexico, Democrat Martin Heinrich, to act on what the Supreme Court did Friday, which is say Congress has to pass law to ban bump stocks. It can't be done by executive decree or executive action, no matter the party of the president. Bump stocks have their critics in both parties, but this is a different issue altogether. Congress is just not going to fast track anything on an issue as volatile as gun control and gun rights. Here's Senator Heinrich speaking with CBS News earlier today about this overall issue of why gun bunk stocks have to go. There is literally no legitimate use for a bump stock. There's no, there's no law enforcement application for a bump stock. There's no military application for a bump stock. There's no self-defense application for a bump stock. These things are like tailor-made for mass shootings. So how are Republicans defending this blocking of bump stocks legislation? They're arguing the legislation is Democratic crafted and overreaches and ends up blocking out what should be lawful firearms accessories or firearms tools. They say it goes too far and they have to craft the legislation differently. What's more, though, Nancy, I think it's worth underscoring. This is the third of three messaging bills by Democrats over the past right. three weeks. They put on a bill to federalize protections for IVF for contraceptives and bump stocks. None of them was expected to pass. All of them are expected to be used in November. Right. They want to make the point to voters that uh, we're on your side on these issues. Um, changing gears, Scott, the House Ethics Committee confirmed it's still investigating Congressman Matt Gates, and we got more information about what it is that they're looking into. It was quite a barn burner. Tell us uh, what you made of their statement. As you know, Nancy, it's so unexpected, so unusual for the House Ethics Committee to say anything, to publicly declare the sky is blue or that an investigation yeah. is underway. But they did that today, potentially in part because Congressman Gates issued on social media a statement yesterday saying he is still under Ethics Committee investigation and slamming the probe, accusing his opponents of smears and saying he will be exonerated through all of this. What the House Ethics Committee did today was saying it's plowing forward with an investigation of Mr. Gates, saying among the things they're investigating are sex misconduct, illicit drug use, inappropriate receipt, receipt of gifts, and obstructing an investigation. They don't put a timetable on this, but this case, this investigation is gaining tonnage as it goes along, Nancy. Just dozens of subpoenas, a broad and sweeping investigation. And you got to keep in mind, it's both parties who speak for the Ethics Committee. There's an equal number of members of both right. parties on this panel. When they issue a statement, it is both parties saying right. something. At this moment in time in the U.S. House, that is quite something. Very telling that Republicans were willing to go along with that statement. Uh, any reaction 
from Gates uh, or others in Congress. This is a pretty damning list of possible violations. It's quite a set of allegations to put out there in the public sphere. Words like sex and drugs, uh, they ring off the marble walls when you say them. <laughs> Congressman Gates referred us back to his social media post that might have launched this whole public statement in which he says he's going to be exonerated and blasts the allegations. He's also ascribed blame to this to former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The former speaker, he says, was behind the ethics probe or played some role in getting it going. You'll recall Matt Gates is one of eight House Republicans who were part of that group who launched that group to oust McCarthy last year. I think we'll end up finding out that Gates had a lot more to do with this investigation being launched than Kevin McCarthy. But we'll uh, watch and see. Scott McFarlane, thank you so much. Take a look at this video. It's a cheap fake. And the White House says President Joe Biden has become a victim. So what are cheap fakes? We're going to explain next. You're streaming America Decides. You've probably heard of deep fakes, but just last week, as President Biden was at the G7 summit in Italy, cheap fake clips went viral on social media and were picked up by some news outlets. Uh, take a look at this clip, for example. It shows Biden and other world leaders watching a skydiving demonstration before the president is seen walking away and looking in another direction. Outlets uh, claimed that uh, he was sort of just aimlessly wandering away. The clip amassed millions of views within just a few hours when actually he, if you widen out, you can see that he was talking to one of the members of the military that was participating in that uh, demonstration. So uh, how prevalent are cheap fakes? And how big of a problem will they be in this election? Well, uh, let's take a look with executive editor of CBS News Confirmed, Rona Tarrant, who joins us now from Studio 57 to explain. Hi, Rona. It's great to see you. Hi. So uh, tell us how long cheap fakes have been around. I'm assuming they've been around since the uh, beginning of, of the media because, uh, you know, anybody can, can take a, an image and manipulate it to... Uh, make it look like it suggests something that didn't happen. That's exactly it. It really is a case of old techniques meets new technology. So, as you said, um, cheap fake videos, and that's videos that are edited in a really simple way, those have been around as long as political videos have existed. So there's a few ways, for example, that people might be familiar with. One is there might be a long video and you might take a very short clip and you take out key context. Mm -hmm. Another is maybe you slow something down and it makes it sound like someone is slurring their words. Or another is you might splice several pieces together and it makes it sound like someone said something that they didn't. What's different in this election and the last two elections in the presidential elections is, uh, number one, everyone has access to mobile phones where they can edit. And number two, most people have social media accounts where they can publish this stuff. So um, it's worth saying these are not anything new. You know, when Trump was president, uh, these targeted him as well. But what we are seeing in the last few weeks is really the steady stream of videos that are targeting uh, President Biden and, in particular, taking aim at his age. Right. And they are being picked up by news outlets that know they're fakes and uh, or know that they are misleading, but post them anyway. Uh, Rona, is there any way to measure the impact that these videos could have on the 2024 election in comparison to other forms of misinformation? You know, that's a really great, great question. I think, you know, in terms of what our team has been tracking, we have seen these um, so-called cheap fake videos. They are targeting Biden and they are targeting Trump. However, we have seen, particularly in the last few, few months, the videos targeting Biden are getting a lot more traction online, and in particular, the ones that target Biden's age. So, for example, right. like you had said, claiming that he is wandering off and really was having a conversation with somebody. These videos are effective because they are, they're called cheap fakes for a reason. They are quick. They're easy to publish, and oftentimes they have big impact on people who are just scrolling through their phones. They watch it for five seconds, and they move on. Also, what's interesting about this is we've heard a lot about the fear of deepfakes in this election. And we've seen that deepfakes haven't really shown up in the way that maybe people were worried about them showing up. But right. these uh, videos that are edited in a really basic way with technology that's been around for a long time are effective, in, to, effective to the extent that the White House is addressing them. Deepfakes, as opposed to cheap 
fakes are, you know, videos uh, or audio that has been completely created by AI. So think um, the robocall that was sent around to uh, Rhode Island, uh, not Rhode Island, uh, New Hampshire voters a few months ago uh, that sounded just like Joe Biden telling them not to vote, but uh, it was a total fake. So, Rona, how can voters best discern between videos that are real and videos that are not? So social media platforms, sometimes they will attach fact checks to these videos. Um, so sometimes on X, you might see community notes, or on Facebook, you might see fact checks. However, the reality is, for the vast majority of them, they're not going to have anything attached. So unfortunately, it really is on the viewer. Number mm. one piece of advice I would have is always check your sources. So if you see something on an account, is this a partisan account? Is it pushing for a particular candidate? And does it have a history of posting misinformation? And the second thing, which I think is really important, is always seek another source. So don't just take it from one account. Make sure that you get a second source or even a third source. And most importantly, make sure that's a credible source. And CBS Confirmed is one of the most credible. Rona Tarrant, thank you so much for breaking it down with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Former President Donald Trump is making a campaign stop in Wisconsin. The battleground state visit comes less than a week after he reportedly called Milwaukee a horrible city. But next, Vice President Kamala Harris teams up with rapper Quavo to talk gun control. You're streaming America Decides. We just brought you CBS News Confirms new reporting on fake videos of President Biden that are being referred to as cheap fakes. So let's bring in our political panel, Megan Hayes and Matt Mowers. Megan served as the director of message planning for the Biden administration. And Matt worked on the Trump 2016 campaign and also worked as a senior advisor for the former president. Hello to you both. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Matt, I'll start with you. You know, what makes these videos and images so insidious is it isn't just anonymous social media users who are putting them out there. It's the New York Post. It's the Republican mm -hmm. National Committee who are disseminating these things, and that lends them an air of authenticity. Uh, should the RNC be in the, vid in, the, in the business of putting out videos like this or... You know, I mean, if they want to attack him on his age, attack him on his age. That's a perfectly right. legitimate issue, right? Well, and they have attacked him on his age. Yeah. And not only that, but, you know, the reason these videos even have some ability to land with voters is because a lot of voters, it's, it's picking up on a kernel of truth. I think that's the bigger challenge. But does challenge, that mean it's that, okay? Well, and, and they should be very careful about making sure that the videos they put out are an accurate representation, although I'm sure we're shocked as folks have been around politics and political <laughs> campaigns that someone would maybe clip something mildly out of context. Fair I mean, enough. I've Fair never enough. seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not, not on any campaign I've ever worked on. But uh, what I'll say is that, you know, the reason they do is because they know it's a narrative that's a problem for the White House. They also know that it's one that can't really go away. Right. Uh, and that as much as there might be a video where they're clipping it a second early, there are countless videos out there where they don't have to. They can play the full minute clip. And sure. it is challenging video for the president. And it's tough to explain away when it's true video that's actually showing the president at a moment that maybe is showing his age. Megan, because this feeds into a pre-existing concern that voters have about really both candidates and their age, how should the Biden campaign approach this? What is their strategy? Look, I think they need to lean into his age, right? Like, we're not, no one's trying to hide that he's 81 years old. Everyone knows he's 81 years old. He talks about it. But I do think with the Trump campaign and the RNC, like, you know, those who live in class houses shouldn't throw stones. He's only, Trump is only a few years younger. And these are types of things that they could clip, someone else could clip something that makes him in a bad light. And that's also not good either. I'm not suggesting that the Biden campaign do that. I'm just saying that, you know, this is mm -hmm. like the season of campaigns. And, but, you know, age is one thing for both of them that they need to, to combat. And so I do think... I would lean into it if I were them. I'd put him in front of voters all of the time and like have him do those retail stops as you've seen him do many times. And he that's where he thrives. And that's where you'll really see Joe Biden being Joe Biden. You were a top campaign aide in 2020. Then you worked in the White House. When you were on the campaign, you were around him more than just about anybody. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen a change, an erosion in his mobility over the past few years that can be attributed to more than just aging three years you know i haven't been around him every day since i left the white house so i actually don't know what he you know what he is like today when i was there he definitely was very had a lot of pep in his step he would outwork all of us we would be on a trip and we would all be sleeping and he would be working so you know i didn't see it when i was there as much as you know other people is he is 
you know, probably as fast as he was when we were in the vice president's office or when he was the Senate? No, absolutely not. I think he's, you know, that comes with age. But in terms of what he is like today versus when I was there, I can't speak to that. But I mean, I think that the president is very busy doing, as you just saw, he did two foreign trips, went to L.A. and he did a speech today and he's, you know, working hard for people. Matt, um, there are lots of questions about mm -hmm. President Trump's mental and physical fitness as well. Is this really an issue that the Trump campaign wants to draw attention to? Well, look, I think you can say a lot of things about President Trump. But one thing you can't say is the guy does have stamina. I mean, he goes up there for an hour and a half long rally and riffs with no teleprompter. I mean, that is, as someone who's run for office, I can tell you that is Sometimes the things he says up there are a little confusing. Well, sure. I mean, in an hour and a half, any of us standing up there going with no teleprompter, we'd occasionally slip up on a word or two. But I'll tell you, that that takes a lot of, you know, work. That takes a lot of stamina. Um, you know, folks are going to question President Trump's policies. Maybe they question temperament, the rest of it. I don't think anyone is truly questioning whether he has the stamina to do the job, not just today. And here's the real question I think a lot of voters are saying. They look at President Biden, they say, we get that, you know, he's 81, there's going to be a slip up. But what about 85? And that's the question. A lot of voters are saying not just how are each of these candidates going to act today, but what's it going to be like four years from now? I'll tell you, I've had, you know, foreign diplomats who've met with the president and asked that question, saying, what is this going to look like in four years if he's reelected? If those are folks who are diplomats from other countries in meetings with the president asking those questions, certainly it's questions that are going to be asked by the American public. I want to ask you guys about the new debate rules that came out uh, today. The debate between President Biden and former President Trump is taking place next week. Um, and they're really interesting. Basically, uh, the rules include no opening statements, no audience. Candidates' microphones will be muted when it's not their turn to speak. They yelled over each other quite a bit uh, the last time around. Uh, and they aren't allowed to bring any notes with them. Uh, what do you make of those rules? Do you think they'll be effective? I do think they'll be effective. As someone who was at both the debates in 2020, I, the yelling over each other and the, the jeers and stuff from the audience, I think it's yeah. distracting. I think that this is a time where the American voters need to see these people debate the issues, and they need to make a decision. And this is one way to do that. And I think that making sure that the it's even playing ground, they're not yelling back and forth at each other or trying to talk over each other or play to the audience, I actually think that's a really smart idea. It's a fine line, though, right, Matt? Because right. if you can't ever <laughs> interrupt then it has the potential to become basically a joint interview, a question exactly right. to one and then a question to the other. And, and look, I, I agree. I think having an audience there sometimes can be distracting. We saw that yeah. in the Republican primary debates this year, Eats especially when there's too. stadiums. I mean, right, and you, especially with commercial breaks during mm -hmm. these debates, which we don't normally have. But I agree. I think the rules are a little over cumbersome. They're going to restrict the ability to have that dialogue, which, yes, there are moments in 2020 when they're talking over each other. The debate almost was unwatchable at times because you couldn't hear what they were saying. But those are the moments that really give the American public glimpses into who these two individuals are, how they're going to react in certain situations. What noises are they making in reaction? Are they keeping their cool in those moments? I think we're losing a little something with that because of the debate rules. And you know, f hopefully in uh, future debates, we can actually see the true interaction between the two candidates. I don't think muted microphones are going to change that true interaction. <laughs> but I mean, one can hope that we don't hear the yelling. But I, I think we will see the interaction. I have a feeling that they're going to be doing some talking even when their <laughs> microphones are muted and we might be able to pick it up really quickly before before you go, uh, Vice President Harris is appearing with Quavo uh, uh, of the group Migos down in Atlanta today in a, in a uh, battleground state to talk about gun safety, an issue that is back in the news because of the Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. last week um, uh, about bump stocks. What do you make of her decision to go? And should Republicans embrace a bump stock ban if it's something that President Trump himself supported mm -hmm. six years ago. Well, look, I mean, this, to your point, I mean, this is actually allows Donald Trump to go out there and highlight an area that maybe he is, quote unquote, more moderate on on Second Amendment issues or gun rights issues uh, that could actually help him maybe make inroads with some of those suburban voters in key counties, whether it's Oakland County in Michigan or uh, Chester County in Pennsylvania, a few of these areas where he's going to need to actually, um, you know, pick up a few votes. Not to mention the fact that Kamala Harris is now going clearly on defense by going and speaking to a Hispanic group um, in, in Georgia. This is a group of voters that traditionally has been lock, stock, and barrel with the Democratic Party. You see recent polling showing Donald Trump possibly winning a majority of the Hispanic vote. I think it shows a lot more defense and offense based on where the vice president's going today. I think this also highlights the, that the president and the vice president have done all they can on gun safety issues and that Congress actually needs to act now. And I think that this is highlighting that issue as well and that they will do more if they are reelected for, or, you know, push Congress to do more. So I just think that, 
they, this is an important issue that she needs to highlight. I actually, the vice president, I think, is a great messenger here for this. Megan Hayes, Matt Mowers, thank you both so much. Really interesting conversation today. Thank you so I much. Appreciate yeah. it. Donald Trump is campaigning in the battleground state of Wisconsin, where the Republican National Convention is scheduled to kick off less than a month from today. Can you believe we're there already? The presumptive Republican presidential nominee delivered remarks in Racine this afternoon. Today marked his third appearance in that state since his felony, first since the felony conviction, third of the year. Our Jake Rosen is in Racine, Wisconsin now. Jake, so good to see you. Tell us uh, what you're hearing and seeing there. Hey, Nancy. So the, in conversations with voters and the state GOP before Donald Trump took the stage here in Racine, the big focus and emphasis was on election integrity. I spoke to a voter named Scott Milhouse. Here's what he had to say about his concerns going into November. I'm worried about the fact that, that nothing's been done to protect our elections. You know, I, I worry about the security. I mean, we, we all know what happened in 2020. And, and I worry that we're going to see some of the same tactics in, in Wisconsin. It was very difficult for me to flip this flag and wear it upside down, but we all know that's, that symbolizes a country in distress. And we are clearly in distress. Uh, whether it's the state level, the local level, we've got sham elections that, that I don't know if my vote is being counted. And Nancy, 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 this was part of a big push by the Trump campaign across the rally in Detroit, both rallies in Detroit over the weekend, and here, early voting. How can conservative voters who have been told for the last four years that the election was stolen, that it was rigged, that it wasn't working, how can they vote effectively, and will they trust voting? And as you heard from Mr. Milhouse there, he does not trust voting in 2024 in November. That's definitely the message they've gotten from Trump. Uh, Jake Rosen at a very boisterous rally in Racine, Wisconsin. Thanks so much. As support grows for mass deportation of illegal migrants, the White House announces a new effort that could give over half a million people a path to citizenship. Senior advisor to President Biden, Tom Perez, joins America Decides next with more on the president's plan. You're streaming America Decides. Stick around. The White House's new program impacting undocumented spouses is the second time in a month that President Biden has taken executive action on immigration. He previously restricted asylum claims along the southern border. Tom Perez joins us now. He's a senior advisor to President Biden. Tom, it is great to see you. So what makes the oh, White House... What makes the White House confident that this plan is going to survive legal scrutiny and actually go into effect later this summer when so many other immigration plans from Trump, from Obama, have been struck down by the courts? Well, I think it's the right thing to do. It's the legal thing to do. And it's the smart thing to do. Uh, what the president did two weeks ago was to secure the border because we have to both secure the border and provide lawful pathways. That's what a balanced approach is all about. And he did that two weeks ago. Today, it's a very simple thing what he's doing, but it's very impactful. If you've been here 10 years or more and you are married to a U.S. citizen, rather than having to go back to your home country where you were born and apply for citizenship, you can do it here. And while you apply, you will be able to get a work authorization. The average person who benefits from this program has been in this country 23 years. They are part of the fabric of the community. Their kids were born here. Their church is in the neighborhood. Their kids are going to school. They're business owners. And so I'm confident this is both the, uh, a, a proper legal pathway and, more importantly, it's about keeping families together, keeping communities together. And we have a workforce shortage. This is about helping them get out of the underground economy. Talk to every employer. I'm your former labor secretary. Talk to employers. I ask them what keeps you up at night. Workforce, workforce, workforce. So this is both the humane thing to do, the right thing to do, and the smart thing to do. Uh, and yet, Tom, a lot of C uh, voters seem to think it's not the smart thing to do. CBS News polling recently found that 62 percent of Americans mm. are in favor of a national program to deport all undocumented immigrants, all 11 million of them. So how much support do you think there would be for the White House plan that was announced today? I'd, I'd love to sit down with your polling team and show them how they've gotten this wrong, because uh, you know, I saw polling literally a week ago 
that shows that when you explain to people, if someone has been here 10 years or more and they're married to a U.S. citizen, do you think they should have a pathway to citizenship? Over 70 percent of those polled said yes, because yes. it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, we are a nation of laws and we are a nation of immigrants. And that is what this investment's about. And, and there's one other thing that the president did that's also, I think, very both uh, necessary, common sense, and the right thing to do, and that is uh, to allow dreamers who have completed their college education and they have a job offer to be able to get the work permit. The notion that we encourage people to go to college here and then we don't give them a work permit that makes no sense at all. And so the president is taking action to allow those folks to get those work permits. Yeah, uh, progressives are very happy with this policy. Uh, but after the president unveiled his executive actions on asylum earlier this month, there was a huge backlash from those same progressives. Uh, the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus told America Decides back then that uh, she thought the president should do something different. And it's going to sound familiar. Take a listen. As quickly as possible, we would like the president to provide protections uh, for uh, undocumented folks who've been here for a long time. One of those things is parole in place for the spouses of U.S. citizens, making sure that we're keeping families no, together. I mean, These are people who've been here for a long time that we know they're our neighbors, our friends, um, they're married to American citizens, and yet they're at risk of being deported. So, Tom, that sounds exactly like what the president announced today. Was this plan that he just unveiled designed to appease no. those progressives? No, the, the president, the day he announced, first of all, you know, leadership is about doing things that your friends sometimes don't agree with. And the president, uh, when he announced his border security policy, he understood that uh, many people uh, in our own party uh, did not agree with that. Today, he acknowledged that he did some things that people don't agree with, mm -hmm. but he believes, and I agree, that it was the right thing to do. We need to secure our borders. And that's exactly what he did. And by the way, Border encounters are down about 25 percent since he took those actions. When he gave that speech two weeks ago, he said, in the weeks to come, I will be talking about how to build an immigration system that is fair and just. He said that two weeks ago. And this is today the follow-up on what he said two weeks ago. Balance is what has always been a part of our bipartisan infra in, uh, immigration infrastructure. The party of Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush and Lincoln and George Herbert Walker Bush, they supported immigration reform. We are a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. And, and the notion that this person who's been in his community or her community for 23 years, they have kids uh, who were born here, this is their home. Uh, the notion that you want to send them all home, uh, that's totally antithetical to our values. And that's why the president stood firm today to announce this program. I think it's going to help so many people remove the shadow that has been over their heads for so long. Well, we'll watch to see if it really uh, does come to fruition later this summer. Uh, there will be a lot of people who are interested in applying. Tom Perez, thanks so much. Always a pleasure. The legendary Talking Heads frontman David Byrne was turning heads on Capitol Hill today. The Rock and Roll Hall of Famer was there to urge senators to vote for the American Music Fairness Act. What's that? Well, it's a bill that would require AM and FM radio stations to pay a fee to an artist each time their song is played. Uh, the bipartisan bill has been introduced in both the House and the Senate Judiciary Committees, but it has basically fallen on deaf ears since then. Radio stations owners like uh, iHeartRadio, which owns more than 800 stations, oppose the bill, as you can imagine. Same as it ever was. And that does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Report with John Dickerson starts right now. Have a good one.